Uh, our session is now being recorded. I'd like to welcome Melissa from the University of Toledo, who is our speaker today. Um, she's got a great story to tell about how um, Toledo has changed the accessibility climate at their institution. So without further ado, Melissa, if you'd like to start. All right, thank you, Sally. All right, that was not my first slide. There we go. Okay, so again, my name is Melissa Gleckler. I'm with the University of Toledo, where I am an educational technologist. That is my full-time role at the University of Toledo. But I actually wear quite a few hats here at UT. I um, am a part-time instructor in the Department of Communication. I'm also serving a three-year term, elected term, on our professional staff council. And I am a student. I'm in the dissertation phase of my PhD. Um, and the reason I'm sharing that with you is that while I'm talking to you from the standpoint of my role as an educational technologist, I do have um, a unique insight into the various user roles of Blackboard because I use so many of them myself. I'm an administrator, I'm an instructor, and I'm a student. So I see Blackboard from all of those different um, views. So now that you know a little bit about me, I wanted to learn a little bit about all of you. So we're going to use um, polling for this. And there are only actually five choices. <laughs> so if you are a faculty member, uh, please select one. If you're an instructional designer, two. If you're an educational technologist like myself, or maybe you work in information technology, select three. Um, if you're a dean or administrator, or if you're in marketing communications, select four, since we don't have a number six. Um, or if you're an accessibility specialist, select five. And I'm asking this question because um, I have a communication degree and I like to know my audience um, when, I'm, when I'm speaking. And this will also give me some insight when we have question and answer at the end. So I see I have a lot of fellow ed techs and IDs on with me today, welcome. All right. So we'll end that poll there. So thank you for participating in that poll. I might pop another one up. I want to keep you uh, keep you engaged throughout the presentation. Now, uh, one of the things um, that we talk about when it comes to accessibility um, is what makes a college campus accessible? And um, it, this slide should say, what makes a college campus accessible? Um, so we usually think about the physical things as far as accessibility on campus, such as wheelchair accessible parking spaces and bathroom stalls, curb cuts that we see on the sidewalks, levers on doors instead of doorknobs, and these are all very important pieces of campus accessibility. However, the digital accessibility of a campus is just as important as the physical accessibility of a campus. And it's the part that's hidden. And we know that many disabilities are hidden. 10% of Americans have an invisible or hidden disability. And these statistics come from the US Census Bureau and can be found on a variety of websites and sources um, dedicated to accessibility. Invisible disabilities are also the most common type among college students. And keep in mind that invisible disabilities, most of us think of learning disabilities, but they are not the only type of invisible disability. Um, not every disability is visible, and that can include physical disabilities. Um, not all disabling conditions are necessarily disclosed or registered with the Student Disabilities Office. Also important to keep in mind. So you might not always get um, a notification if you're teaching a class that you need to make your content accessible. And the other thing to keep in mind is in an online environment, all disabilities are invisible. I teach online myself um, and I wouldn't know unless a student is registered with Student Disability Services and I get a notification or if that student lets me know him or herself what accommodations they might need if they have low vision, if they have um, some hearing loss, if they 
struggle to use a mouse if they're using screen readers. So let's use um, the example of, uh, let's see, let's use the example of blindness as um, a disability we wanna look a little further into here. Blindness is not binary. It's not that somebody can see or can't see. There are levels in between, and that's true of any disability. So when we're creating accommodations, those are the kinds of things that we have to consider. And if we don't get a notification, there are still things we can do to make the content more accessible. So let's look at, um, for example, macular degeneration, early onset of macular degeneration. I put a filter on this um, particular slide so that you could see an example of early macular degeneration. You can still read that slide, right? Everybody can read that slide. So not everyone with vision issues is necessarily using a screen reader or braille. Uh, maybe they benefit from audio versions or just using high contrast so that they can view the content better. Um, maybe they use corrective lenses. Corrective lenses are an assistive device. Um, they might move the content within their sight lines and alternative text is still important on all images. But unless you work in accessibility, you might not know about those things. So that's what building the culture is all about because various, um, there's another example of a vision issue where you can still see the content, but an audio version might be helpful, high contrast might be helpful. So when we talk about digital accessibility, think about what I just showed you and in comparison to the physical accessibility of your institution or organization, how would you rate your institution or organization's digital accessibility? So I'm gonna open up the polling again. Um, Bear with me. All right, so I'm going to start that poll. So if you'd say that uh, the, access the digital accessibility of your campus is low, select one. If you'd say you're probably in a reactive state, that you're compliant, but it's usually when you get those notifications that content needs to be re remediated, and that's pretty common, I'd say, probably from what most campuses. They're probably at a medium. If you'd say that you're in a proactive state, that you're exceeding the minimum, um, select high, and anybody who selects four is invited to take over the webinar from here. I appreciate those honest responses, and I would honestly say I see a lot of people selecting number two, um, the greatest proportion, saying, eh, we're medium, we're, we're probably in a reactive state, and I would say that's um, where the University of Toledo was as well, um, with some proactive measures in place, so I'll talk about that a little bit for all of you here. But we're looking to move this needle up at the University of Toledo. And I'm going to share with you how um, some of our act activities, as well as the implementation of Ally, helped us do that. And um, I'm mentioning Ally now because the gauges that you're seeing on your screen are directly from Ally. So that's a little foreshadowing for all of you. So the University of Toledo is a traditional institution. We are a state public institution. We sit on a 982-acre main campus. We also have a health science campus with a hospital. We have over 22,000 students in undergraduate as well as graduate programs that include not only PhD but MD programs, PharmD programs, and we have a college of law. We are a public research institution. Of our 22,000 students, about 36 percent of them engage in some form of online courses. So we don't necessarily have students who are either online or on campus. Many of them are a combination of both. We do have a few 100% online programs, but those students are still students of the University of Toledo as a whole. So we are a traditional institution. And in that sense, we have the same challenges when it comes to accessibility as other large institutions. The question becomes, Whose job is it? Whose job is it to assure ADA for, and 504 compliance? Now, of course, we have dedicated offices, staff, and policies in place for that. We have experts, such as our Department of Internal Audit and Compliance, which houses or oversees student disability services. And that's usually the face of um, accessibility at any institution is student disability services. That's where our um, accessibility specialists are housed, et cetera. We also have a technology accessibility policy. And even more importantly, we have uh, technology accessibility procedures. There's a procurement process 
that every software has to go through in order to be approved and implemented in any coursework here at the university. Um, and that's to assure um, ADA compliance with that. We, we always have to get the VPAT and we have a whole process and several people who are involved in that approval in several offices. We also have um, an Office of Diversity and Inclusion with a strategic plan that's uh, actually looking to be um, reviewed and rewritten for the 2019-2020 academic year. Because the last one was implemented for the 2016 year, so it's, it looks like it's about every three years they're doing that. I do sit on that committee myself. There are committee members from academic colleges, from information technology and web development uh, that sit on that committee and um, inform that committee. I see a few hands just to let you know we will open it up for questions at the end of um, the session. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there because I've seen a few hands raised. Now back to that diversity and inclusion plan and IT and web development. There are also um, specific positions dedicated to ADA in pockets in those areas as well. So I know that there's an information technology um, specialist who um, has foundational knowledge in ADA compliance and our director of web development also oversees ADA compliance of our website. Um, in U Toledo Online, we hired an instructional mm -hmm. designer specific to ADA. Now that doesn't mean she's the only one in U Toledo Online who does ADA. She's our resident expert and she also teaches all of us so that um, that compliance is part of our efforts with help desk and technical support, the educational technology trainings that I and my colleagues do. We also write faculty guides and documentation for, um, for our faculty, as well as some student guides. And even those guides have to be ADA compliant. They are digital communications. Um, we offer instructional design services to faculty, as well as courses and workshops, and one-on-one -on -one consultations. And then the next level of that was implementing Blackboard Ally. Now, while we did that as part of U Toledo Online, it really included members from those dedicated offices and staff because accessibility is everyone's job. And that's what building a culture of accessibility, especially digital accessibility, is all about, is that it's everyone's job. So some of the ways that we make that happen is by teaching the faculty how to teach online. And now, um, the, the graphic is meant to be funny because I myself have fond memories of riding in the back of a station wagon. But as time goes on and um, advances in technology come to pass, we know that there are better ways to do things that um, are better for other people and better for kids and better for learners and whatnot. So that's why I chose this graphic. So that's what I mean by teaching faculty to teach online. It's not that faculty don't know how to teach. They're subject matter experts. They're not technology experts and they're not accessibility experts and we cannot expect them to be. So we need to build that culture and we home grow our champions for accessibility and technology because teaching online presents challenges but it also presents opportunity because teaching online enables differentiation and in instruction through technology. And using technology works very well with assistive technology. We know that technology has made huge differences in the lives of people with disabilities because it can level the playing field in so many ways. Teaching online also expands access to education for those who might be place bound. And those who are place bound are not necessarily place bound by distance. So access to a university education might be more possible if they can do that from their home because they have limited mobility or capability to do that. So that's why it's ever so important to create a digital accessibility culture at our institution because online is alive and well and we are going to continue to grow that. Now, one of the ways that um, we're helping faculty, I, I had mentioned that we do consultations and workshops. Um, I don't know what happened to half my graphics here. <laughs> I didn't load these slides, so um, I'm teaching a course that's self-paced called Teaching with Blackboard 101. Thank you, Travis. Um, we, we have the self-paced faculty development course. It's in the pilot phase. We just launched this for summer in a pilot. And I am actually conducting this as an IRB approved study at the institution with nine modules that are self-paced and self-directed in Blackboard. And these modules um, teach design as well as technical training. Every module has a test kitchen activity. We provide them with a practice course that we're calling a test kitchen. 
Um, and if you see Test Kitchen and you see that little guy with an apron, even though my graphic is a little uh, jumbled up with this particular share on um, Collab, uh, there's a cooking theme because we're calling it fine a la carte training because it's an a la carte type of uh, learning scenario. And so we, we really ran with that theme and we're, we're trying to um, enable the classroom chefs with all the uh, tools of the trade, if you will. Now, one of the other things that's within this course is a link to an exemplary course. Uh, we are a Quality Matters subscriber institution. It, uh, some of you might also be QM institutions. And QM does have a component of standards um, related to uh, accessibility and user-friendliness, user usability. So it's part of what we're teaching as part of the design training in that course, and as well as giving them an example of what a good course looks like. And every module ends with extend your thinking prompts. And these prompts send them out to um, some of the different courses that we have where they can augment their, their learning even more. And the one I mentioned here is ADA COC, that's our nickname for it. It stands for ADA Compliance and Online Courses. Um, ADA Compliance and Online Courses is obviously monumentally important. Um, there's that graphic again, it's not supposed to be there. Uh, I have to look at my own slides so that I know what I'm reading here. Pardon me. So this is a five week online faculty development course that is facilitated by our ADA instructional designer in UT online. She is our expert. It is one of five courses in what we call our master online instructor pathway program. This is how we develop a culture of accessibility is by teaching faculty how to do this. Um, I've taken this course. It is fantastic. I will say when I came to this institution, I probably didn't know much. This was 12 years ago. I didn't know much about creating accessible content. And we've had resources right here in the institution that have taught me and helped me become the champion that I am for accessibility. This course gave us a review of the legislation and the web content assurance guidelines with hands-on practical application um, to remediate content as well as um, use some principles of universal design for learning. That's what UDL stands for. Because part of that culture building is um, explaining how it's much easier to design a course to be accessible from the beginning rather than to go back and remediate it when you get that notification from Student Disability Services. Um, but the question becomes, how do you know that your content is accessible? You don't interact with it the same way that somebody with a disability might. So how do you know that your content is accessible? And that's where Blackboard Ally is bridging that gap for us. Um, Next slide, there we go. Blackboard Ally provides um, instructor tools with Ally indicators that are these color-coded gauges that uh, these gauges look familiar from our slide before when we were uh, rating our institution's accessibility. They range from low to high or even perfect. Um, and faculty can click on the um, score on that little gauge and get a how-to remediation panel. Let's see if this is going to work. No, the GIF is not working. So what a faculty member can do is they click on the, um, the score. It opens up a remediation panel that tells them how to fix this and how it will affect their score and raise the score. And it does it instantaneously when they upload the new document. So um, it's pretty amazing what it can do. And it's bridging that gap to teach faculty how to recognize an accessible content and how to fix it. So when we brought Blackboard Ally to campus, we had to think critically about all the stakeholders involved. So we established an implementation team, largely from UT Online, which is my division. Our director of UT Online was uh, the head of that team, uh, along with our ADA instructional designer and an ed tech, which was myself. And because we are a self-hosted institution for Blackboard, we also pulled on a member of our server and data admin team. We also had uh, members from Student Disability Services, including the Director of Student Disability Services. And that director was part of the purchase of Ally. She, she went to the Provost's office along with her boss, the Director of Internal Audit and Compliance, to get the approval to purchase Blackboard Ally for our institution. And we also brought on an academic accommodation specialist 
as well as a senior analyst from IT to that team. Now, once we purchased Ally with support from both the provost and the compliance offices, we um, put it onto our dev server so that we could do some testing. And that's when we established the Ally team. So some of the members of the Ally team were on board from the um, beginning with the purchase. That would include uh, the director of UT Online, the director of Student Disability Services, our ADA designer, and the director of Internal Audit and Compliance. And then the rest of us were pulled onto the team once Ally was purchased, and we knew that we were going to be piloting, piloting it in summer of 2018. We piloted with a small group of voluntary faculty. We put the, the call out to faculty we work with often. We had about 10 faculty members who agreed to try it out in their courses for summer. Over the summer, we also had a two-day uh, visit from a Blackboard representative to establish our goals and our timeline, as well as a two-day Blackboard Train the Trainer web workshop. Now, this was wonderfully helpful to us. So if you're an institution that's thinking about getting Blackboard Ally, uh, I have to give a shout out and be complimentary to Blackboard and all that they did to help us get ready and smoothly roll out um, Blackboard Ally because change is hard for everybody. And uh, we were concerned at how faculty might receive it because faculty do a wonderful job here and we wanna give them more tools. So um, they really helped us establish what's the best way to implement this and roll it out to faculty. And one of the suggestions that we took and we did, we, we introduced Ally through the leadership of our faculty senate. Um, that was the soft introduction followed by the introductory welcome email for the semester that Ally was enabled in all of their courses for fall of 2018. And we put a link to the guides, which I spent the summer writing. I actually wrote up our screen stops guides and um, I wrote a guide for students and I wrote a guide for faculty because of course those user views are different. So to explain to faculty what's there for them. And then I also created that guide for students. We shared that with faculty so that faculty could tell students how to get to the alternative formats in Ally, which I'm going to talk about next. So we've had some surprising statistics uh, since the implementation of Ally. This is aggregate data from summer and fall of 2018. And really, it's mostly from fall of 2018 because remember in summer, we only had this piloted with about 10 faculty members. So in that basically first semester of having Ally enabled in all of our courses, we've had about, uh, we've had over 4,000 instructor clicks on um, gauges to open up the remediation panel and 730 uh, fixed content items in courses just in one semester. And what even surprised us more was the use of alternative formats. We had, um, 18,000 students click on alternative formats and uh, over 10,000 download alternative formats. So if we look at the instructor feedback usage data, that peaked between August and mid-September. And that makes sense because that was the start of the fall semester. So that means that they read the email, they saw those little gauges in their course and they said, what is this? And they clicked on it. And not only did they click on it, 730 times they fixed something just in that first semester. And the students are using the alternative formats. And alternative formats, um, that's the other feature, the other big feature besides the uh, indicators and instructor feedback in Ally. The alternative formats are the other big deal. And they offer accessible content in the interim while the faculty member might be working to remediate their content to be accessible. Um, and what's really neat about alternative formats is it's really about inclusive education. So even for the student who prefers to learn orally, um, if they prefer to learn on an iPad, there are alternative formats that work better for them and they're finding them and they're downloading them and using them. Um, and even if they need eBraille or a tagged PDF to work better with their screen reader, for example, they're finding those formats and downloading them and using them. So we're really excited 
to see that data, and it surprised us greatly. And uh, we're coming up on the full one-year implementation, so I'm excited to see what the numbers look like at, um, by next fall when we start, because we will have had a full year of Ally in place and only growing. So this is what is helping us move the needle from medium to high. I would say before we were somewhere between medium and high because of our efforts like um, our trainings and our courses that we offer. But Blackboard Ally has helped us move that needle to solidly be in that green area of high, 67 to 99%, almost there. And um, we always say even an ally, perfect is a great goal. Sometimes it's not achievable, it's not realistic, and we know we might not ever be perfect, but we know we are um, accessible. We're digitally accessible, and we're going to continue to create that culture here at the University of Toledo. So now I'd like to open it up to questions. I saw raised hands, and I don't know if they were for technical issues or if it if questions popped up in your head while we were um, while we were discussing what we're doing here at UT. So I want to open it up for questions. Um, also, if you want to know more about what we do in U Toledo Online, I've put our website there, www.utoledo.edu slash DL. And if you'd like to see our ADA 504 compliance policy and the technology policies that I mentioned, uh, you can find those at our um, Office of Internal Audit. The website is www.utoledo.edu slash office slash internal audit. All right, so um, to open it up for questions, and I might need you to weigh in here, Sally. What is, ah, I see questions okay. coming up. There we go, there's one question. <laughs> yeah, so the question, the chat functionality is now open. You will not have audio, You it is just chat. So if you could um, take a minute to en enter your questions into the chat, and then Melissa and I will go through those and, and respond as, um, as many as we can. <laughs> in Wonderful. the time remaining. Thank you. Okay. So um, I saw the first question, and I love this question. It's from Stephanie. Have you had pushback from instructors regarding the implementation of Ally? If so, how did you address that? That was a great question, and uh, we were totally anticipating that, and, and we haven't had any. <laughs> we, we were, those are the surprising statistics. We were pleasantly surprised at how much faculty said, oh, thank you, this helps. Um, yes, we'll do it. Um, you know, the, we've, we've even had them say uh, they expected it when we announced it, they expected it would be more intrusive because the gauges aren't terribly intrusive and it's only in their view, students don't see it. Um, so they've actually been very welcoming of it. Um, so I'd love to tell you how we addressed pushback, but we didn't have any. Um, and then let's see. So I heard, I see, are you familiar with Reed Speaker? Um, so I'm not familiar with Reed Speaker. I have heard, because uh, I'm not an accessibility specialist, nor am I an expert. Uh, I know just enough to be dangerous, right? Um, but I can say this. You're asking how do, uh, how do Ally's alternative format feature, how does it work? Um, I've downloaded a couple alternative for formats, and, and I've listened to the MP3 versions. Um, they're really easy to follow. So much like I personally, when I watch a video, I, my hearing is fine. When I watch a video, I turn on the captions because I'm a visual learner. So seeing the words helps me. So much like I like to turn on the captions on a video, somebody who doesn't have sight issues might still want to download that MP3, and it's a very comfortably read audio. So I hope that answers your question, Jason, because I was impressed with that. It didn't sound computery or anything like that. That's what I was expecting from Ally, and that's not how it works at all. It was a very comfortable read. Um, I do not own the ADA COC syllabus, Jenny, so I don't know that um, I I don't know about the willingness to share it. Um, that is under the ownership of our ADA instructional designer. I can always ask, but um, I don't I don't have the answer to that question because it's not mine to share. Um, Bob, your question gives me a smile. Were faculty required to take, uh, maybe were faculty required to take accessibility workshops? The answer is no. Um, there's no requirement. It is elective. Um, so to get faculty enrollment in the program, to answer Chad, um, Ally is enabled in every Blackboard course. So it's not that they enroll in using Ally. 
Now, if you're asking about our, our ADA COC course, our ADA compliance course, also elective, we promote it every semester. Um, faculty interest is there, um, but also where faculty aren't quite there yet, that was one of the reasons I developed the BD 101 course that I did, so that faculty could um, learn some, learn a little bit, and if they decide to go to the next step, we can encourage them to do that. Um, OERs, that's a whole other animal, and there are um, faculty who do that. Um, I am not part of that conversation largely enough to answer that question with any authority or uh, real anecdotal evidence or knowledge to share with you. So um, I personally use OERs in my own courses, um, and they have been a great asset for me, and they save money for students, so um, I'm, I'm a proponent of it. Um, but we also have that procurement process in making sure that they're accessible. Um, so we always go through the procurement, procurement process, even for free software, we do that. Um, faculty do not get a stipend for attending the workshops. It is considered a uh, free faculty development for them. Um, although I don't hate that idea because uh, whatever we can do to get them to come, I'm a fan of that. Um, and okay, Lisa, I'm glad to see I have librarians on the survey. Um, it, it wasn't a choice on my survey. I didn't even have enough. I, I was only allowed five choices and I had six as it was. So I'm, I'm very sorry for leaving you out, but I'm glad you're here. Um, librarians are some of my favorite people. I work very closely with some of our librarians here at the University of Toledo as well. Um, I don't know if I can share our guides for faculty and students. Um, I'd have to ask my supervisor about that. Um, ah, screen readers and the expense there. So yeah, that is, um, it is prohibitively expensive. Accessibility is expensive, we've found in many ways. Um, I wish I could tell you a uh, solution um, for that, uh, but maybe begin the conversation with um, your internal audit, uh, with your provost, uh, with people who might have the money to help you with that. Um, Ally with Moodle. Okay, so I we have not experienced a problem with docs never showing the Ally gauge as far as I know, or the alt format icon. Um, we haven't experienced that here at the University of Toledo. If anybody else can weigh in on Larry's question, um, he's using Ally with Moodle. We use Ally with Blackboard. Um, I don't know if that's a software compatibility issue or something going on there. Um, you could always submit a help ticket. That's always what I recommend. And I, I have to tell you that um, I've submitted Blackboard Ally help tickets, and they were solved lightning fast. So um, I would highly recommend that because I bet that you would find your solution by working with the Ally team with Blackboard to solve that problem. And yes, Stacy, it's my understanding this will be available later as a recording. Um, thank you for letting me know about the second link for documents. It, uh, Chris, it does work in my version. Sally uploaded the slides, and some of my slides uh, were corrupted in that upload that I saw. There were some um, interesting things there. And Chris, interesting that you're um, getting a lot of faculty pushback. I would. I would actually love to hear your story on that and um, maybe how you had, how you went about implementing Ally and uh, trying to figure out what might have led to the pushback because it has been surprisingly welcomed uh, with open arms here at the University of Toledo. We've been really happy about that. Um, notable system latency downtime in first initializing Ally. Uh, no, we did not have that um, issue. One of the things I do uh, when I do a workshop with a faculty member to teach them about Ally and what to expect, um, and I even put it in our screen steps guides that I wrote, um, is that when they upload an item into their course, not to expect the gauge immediately, that it does take time to render. The computer has to read it. It is a computer-generated score. The alternative formats are computer-generated, so depending on the size of the file, um, it might take a little longer for that indicator to pop up. Um, that is about the only lag or downtime that I might note. But as far as initializing, implementing 
Um, we didn't seem to have any issues that I know of. Uh, when we discussed it on my ally team, we had that member of server data administration who is the one who helped implement everything and um, have it up and running in our courses. And uh, there were no issues. It was pretty seamless. Um, Are instructors responsible for finding course resources and providing them in the course? Uh, generally, yes. Instructors have um, academic freedom and they design their own courses. Now, in some cases, um, there might be a departmental decision about what materials they use, et cetera, depending on the course. So being such a large institution, that's a broad question that I don't want to generalize too much, but generally, yes instructors have academic freedom and design their own courses. And that's one of the reasons, especially with online, we provide them with an assigned instructional designer. Yes, the session will be available later. Let's see, I'm going through questions, bear with me. Yes, we have top-down administrative support, and that was uh, by design. We purposely sought that before we even purchased Ally, and we made sure to involve faculty as we uh, rolled it out when we did the pilot, when we went to Faculty Senate. Uh, we knew that was very important for faculty acceptance. Um, regarding the stats that I shared, Megan, um, yes, we can run reports in Ally. Um, I actually got those statistics from um, somebody from Ally who I recently hosted for a visit here on our campus, and he met with us to um, discuss how Ally is uh, working in its first, how it was working in its first semester with us, and he just came over the spring semester to visit with us. So that's where I got those stats. Um, you could reach out to your Blackboard representatives to try to get stats. I know they can get those for you. So you're answering each other, so that's awesome. Thank you. Yes, Sally, there were some wonky things. I just saw your comment. Yes, there were some wonky things that happened. Okay. Bob, I'm not sure when you say what tools do you use for closed captioning, if you mean at the University of Toledo or if you meant for this particular session. Um, I would have to defer that question to our Office of Student Disability Services. I'm an ed tech. I am not an accessibility specialist, so I don't closed caption videos. I do, but I only do my own, um, and I actually use YouTube to do it. And um, also for videos, uh, when we use, we have uh, we're, we have Echo 360 here at the University of Toledo, and um, Echo 360 has new uh, auto speech reg recognition software built into it. So uh, we're just starting to pilot that. Um, but for now, uh, most of the time when something needs to be closed captioned from a faculty member, it goes to student disability services to be done. Um, and then those of us with the know-how um, sometimes do the closed captioning ourselves. We might use a captioning tool online or we can use uh, YouTube to do it or whatnot. Recommend for making performance videos accessible. You know, Ken, um, and then, you know, the things like that are tough. And I, I understand your, where you're coming from about making performance videos accessible and teaching online music courses um, because I teach visual communication myself. So, um, and I'm still going to build accessibility into everything that I do on my course. Um, what I might recommend is uh, have, have a discussion with somebody from your student disability services office, office of accessibility, whatever you might call it at your institution. Um, because they probably have really good suggestions for you that are even beyond my own creativity or knowledge um, because they're experts. So defer to your experts, find your institutional experts, and thank you for being a champion um, because that's, that's how we build that culture.
All right, I think I got through um, most of the questions. Did I miss any, Sally? Were you following along? I was. I, th I think you did, too. So, so yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for so many questions and, be, and for being so engaged. Um, and if, if you have additional questions, just, you know, type them right in. Um, otherwise, we will, and I'll give you a minute to do that, but otherwise, um, we'll in just a minute early um, and, and give you a little bit of time back in the day. Okay. Alluded to showing us how to get to the alternative formats and ally. Okay. Um, Michael, I don't think we're going to, we don't, we, we don't have the capability to run a demo here, but we can certainly, um, I have your contact information and we'll certainly make sure that you get a demo. Thank you, Sally. Um, Cause I was going to say one of the things that I had in my original PowerPoint um, was uh, the image of the Blackboard Ally in action slide. And um, that was actually a GIF, not a static image where you clicked on the indicator. It opened up the access panel that showed the faculty member um, you know, options to click on what does this mean and how do I fix this and links to guides and step-by-step -step instructions that are there. Um, again, some of those slides got corrupted with import into Collab and that's, you know, technology not talking to each other and this is why I have a job. <laughs> I call it job security. <laughs> this is why technologists like myself exist, I suppose. So. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it's really the alternative formats for the students is very intuitive when they're in their um, and there's an assignment that says, you know, read this. There is a drop down menu where they can um, get access to those alternative formats. So she was mentioning earlier, if you're an audio, um, you know, you prefer to listen to lessons or perhaps you're a student who's commuting, um, whether or not you have any visual disabilities, you may just want to listen to the audio format and it is available right from the drop down. And yes, Michael, I saw what you said about loading a GIF from a PowerPoint slide. Um, so I did not load my slides in. Uh, they came in from Sally's side. So that's just a little technology hiccup. But again, it keeps me employed, so I'm not complaining. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I apologize again. Um, I Unfortunately, we have quite a few events happening today on Global Accessibility Awareness Day, and I just didn't have as much time to trial sure. everything out as I would have liked. <laughs> sure. And, and same on my end, you know. Um, Yes, and yes, the web webinar will be available after. I see a really good question that I want to address from Jennifer. Uh, an institution that bought Ally without a proper rollout and changing the culture at this point. Um, get with your higher ups and get in front of your faculty senate. Um, you know, get that buy in from a top down from whom the faculty uh, feel are their peers. That's where you're probably going to have the most success um, because I would say that's where we had our success because the academic provost was on board with it and we went to the leadership of faculty senate first and then they had us come present at a faculty senate meeting to all the faculty before they got that email that says surprise we're now an ally institution. Um, so they were expecting it and they knew why we did it and they knew that um, their bosses were <laughs> Uh, a pro proponents of it. So, um, you know, uh, pushback might happen, but if you have that top down, I think that's been key to the buy in. Okay, once again, I want to thank you, Melissa. This was a great session. I appreciate the time you put into it and your. Um, about the culture and about how you went about improving um, the accessibility at the University of Toledo. And again, this session has been recorded and the recordings will be available probably early next week and you'll all get an email with the links out to that and they'll be on YouTube. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thanks for spending the afternoon with me.